In this tutorial we will be covering the basics of what shader writing is and how shaders are structured. Now shader writing has a steep learning curve but it's very fun and very rewarding and it is a great skill to have. So don't worry if you find the presentation a little hard to follow. It is just to get an idea of how things work and after the theory we'll go ahead and write a shader line by line explaining how it works in greater depth. You can then go ahead and come back and watch the theory again for greater understanding or you can download the presentation shader and the, the text version of this tutorial in the source files. Let's begin. So what is the noob to pro series? Now the noob to pro series has been broken into three different series. So the beginner series is the fundamentals of shader writing. This is where we cover things from how to write a shader, working with lighting, working with textures. The basics that you will need to be able to write your own shaders. Then we have the intermediate. Now the intermediate series focuses on expanding your knowledge and skill set. So we'll be looking into things like cartoon shading, um, depth of field and depth fold in Unity 3 and awesome things like that. Then we have the advanced series. So the advanced series is a special focus on complex techniques. So we'll focus more on writing very optimized and very clean shaders. We'll be looking into things like image effects and um, just some really cool things that you might not know from, you know, there's not a lot of resources on learning these anywhere else. So I want to have a series focusing just on the very advanced techniques for people who are very well versed in shader art, which you will be of course after the beginning and intermediate series. So this series will teach you how to write shaders from scratch. There will be no built-in components, just clear and concise code. There will be no skipped information, everything is explained. So I want to make sure that you understand what every single line, every word in these code actually does and how it works. So this is the series that I wish I had when I wanted to learn shader writing. Prerequisites, things that you will need to know and have before starting this course. You will need a copy of Unity 4, very straightforward, and you also need to know the basics of how to use it. Now I'm not talking about making levels or making objects or making things animate. All you need to know is basically how the interface works. If you have followed Introduction to Unity on unitycookie.com, you have more than enough knowledge to start this course. You will need some basic scripting knowledge, functions, variables and classes. So if you have never done any programming before, that's fine, you should still be able to follow along, but you might find it a little bit difficult, especially when we get into things like struts and classes. I would highly recommend you go ahead and check out our introduction to scripting tutorial on unitycookie.com. It's a short tutorial and it will give you the fundamentals of scripting that you will need to have. Basic math skills. You will need to have very basic math skills to be able to do programming. So these are things like addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. So the basics of the basics, the things that you learn when you're about 5 or 6. Really important to be able to work with math when we are working with programming. Now optional, calculus will help. If you have stuck with math until your um, late teens and you know things like trigonometry and quadratics and working with linear equations and um, imaginary numbers, all that kind of stuff, that's fantastic. Because what you can do then is you can write some really, really cool shaders. You can make um, things work in ways that they normally wouldn't. Make a light bend to your will. And these are things that we're going to be looking into in the advanced part and a little bit in the intermediate um, series. We'll be covering how to do some really cool effects. We can literally make our mesh explode just with colours. It is really, really fun. If you don't know any calculus, that's perfectly fine. You'll be able to follow along just fine. The last one, this is mandatory, you will need a lot of patience. When it comes to any form of programming, things break a lot. It is very seldom that I will write a shader that actually works the first time around. When it does, I'm still looking for what's going wrong. Because when you write things, there's little things that you overlook, whether it's um, anything from missing a bracket to actually using the wrong variables um, to, you know, errors that even Unity doesn't know what to do with. It's, you do need a lot of patience to be able to debug code and work with shaders. Now in the last part of this series, we will be looking through how to debug shaders and all the errors that you know, Unity will give you and how to fix them. Alright, so this series aims to teach you how shaders work, the fundamentals of shader writing, working with diffuse and specular lighting, working with textures and using normal maps. All of this stuff is the fundamentals that you will need to write your own shaders and we're going to be covering all of it in this first series of this 3 series series. What is a shader? 
In Unity, we have a surface. Behind that surface, we have a material. You'll be quite familiar with this, I imagine, that you know you assign a material to your object and you adjust things like what texture you've got, normal maps, color tint, anything like that. And that is, you know, where it tends to end. But behind a material, we actually have what is called a shader. So a shader controls everything that the material can do. So it takes all of those inputs, those color pickers, those little sliders and variables, it takes them into the shader, it works with them and does whatever it likes. So in the shader we can do things like how it actually reacts to lighting, we can do subsurface scattering, we can do um, anisotropic lighting, we can do a whole bunch of really really cool things. So it is because shaders are used so much throughout our projects, it is a really good idea to learn how to write our own shaders so that we can have exactly what we want on each individual object. So by now, you've probably figured that this is a programming course. So what language are we actually going to be using? Now, Shader Lab. Shader Lab is the core Unity shader language. This is required in all shaders, and it is a very basic language. Then there is CG. Now CG stands for C for Graphics, and it is a shader language developed by NVIDIA. It's an easy to learn and powerful language. GLSL. Now GLSL is a mobile shader and it is very similar to CG. You can actually convert a CG shader to GLSL with the click of a button. We're going to be focusing primarily on CG. So we'll be doing a little bit of shader lab because it's required but primarily our shader writing is going to be using the CG language. Now if you want to learn about GLSL we do have plans to write a GLSL series but everything you need to know is in CG. It is the most common Unity shader language. So let's take a look at what types of shaders there are. Now there are surface shaders. Now these are what we call easy shaders. They require very little code. Uh, quite often there will be shaders that are only about 40 lines of code. It's just a lot of work in the background. When you actually look at the compiled code it's more like 10,000 lines of code. And these are very expensive to render. So surface shaders, we have actually already done a series on how to write surface shaders and these are, you know, they're very good, they look nice, but they're just not very optimized. They, um, you know, kill the performance of your game. So that's why we have vertex and fragment shaders. Now these are what we call from scratch shaders. There is a lot of code, I'm talking, you know, up to a thousand lines of code for some of the shaders I've written. They are more complex, but they are highly customizable. And then we have fixed function shaders. Now fixed function are written entirely in Shader Lab and are primarily for old devices. You'll find a lot of documentation on, um, on the Unity documentation on how to write fixed function shaders. But for now, we're going to be looking at the vertex and fragment shaders. So these are the more complex ones and they're the best ones to know how to use. So what is a vertex and fragment shader? Well we split this up into three separate parts. The interface. This handles everything connecting your shader to Unity. There is a properties box to change the shader. So these are the properties you're familiar with within Unity, such as the color pickers and the sliders and such. We then have the vertex program. Now the vertex program works with your mesh on a per vertex level. This allows vertex deformation within the shader. And we have the fragment program. So the fragment program works with your mesh on a per fragment or per pixel level. So fragment is often referred to as a pixel and this contains the bulk of your shader work. Alright, so let's take a very brief look at the structure of a shader. Now we're actually going to go through and um, take a more in-depth look at some of the more tricky concepts here and then when we actually go write the shader we're going to go through and do this line by line again. So if, don't worry about um, if you don't understand this, it's just to get an idea of what's going to happen. So here is a shader. This is in fact the shader that we are going to be writing in the practical. This is a flat color shader. Now with every shader we start off with a shader name. So this is how Unity refers to the shader uh, within Unity. When we're picking which material, what, what shader we want our uh, material to have, this is what we'll be looking for. Properties. Now this contains everything that we want to interface with. So color picker, sliders, we have a subshader. Now a subshader is effectively our shader. Our entirety of the shader goes within the subshader. And we can have multiple subshaders. We might have a subshader specific to PC. We'll have one specific to Flash and one specific to Xbox 360. And whatever 
our graphics card wants to run, that's the one that it will pick. So if it's an Xbox 360, it will pick the 360 code, and that way we can have one shader that works on multiple machines. Then we have pass. Now passes, these can be thought of as render passes. So we can have things like, you know, one light and one pass, and we can have another light added over the top in a second pass. We can have things such as a diffuse specular lighting model in one pass, and then in another pass we might add in a subsurface scattering component. It's just how we blend together different sets of shaders to make a one complete shader. <coughs> then we have the CG program and NCG. So in between these two tags is everything that is written in the CG language. So when Unity gets to the CG program tag, it will stop processing in Shader Lab and it will start processing in the CG language. Next we have defining variables. So for the CG to actually read our variables that we set in the properties, it needs to be defined. So we can't just say grab color. We need to tell Unity that this is in fact a float color. Um, it is a float for color or a half or a fixed or whatever we need it to be. So defining variables just tells the CG what it's dealing with. Next we have some structs. So structs, if you are unfamiliar with structs, they are kind of like classes. They are a, just a function that contains a set of predefined variables. And we can write to and read from these structs within our different functions. So within Unity, we actually use structs to communicate between Unity and our vertex function, and between our vertex function and our fragment function. We, that is how we use the structs. Next we have the vertex program. So the vertex program works on everything with a per vertex level. So for every vertex in an object, it will run the vertex function. And for the fragment program, will run every pixel. So things in the fragment program can really bog down our shader. But, you know, it is really, really cool. And then we have the fallback. So the fallback is basically, if our shader doesn't work, if, if, um, you know, if we're trying to run this Xbox shader on the PS3 or whatever, then it will run the fallback because it doesn't know how to read that shader. And the fallback just means that it won't come up as bright pink when you um, when you look at the shader on the wrong graphics card. It will just display it as if it was a flat diffuse or a specular or something like that. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these more complex ones in depth. Let's start off with the properties. So here is a properties box. Now properties allow us to interface with the shader to change values. Updating the property on the material changes the corresponding value within the shader. Next we have some variables. So we also need to define these variables within our shader so that, so that the shader can access them. Now the uniform keyword is used to define initial values but it's not required in Unity. It's a good habit if you want to take your shader writing knowledge to a different program such as Maya. There are quite a few different properties that we can use. I've thrown up a few examples of these. So you can see here we have things like um, a texture input, a normal map. We can have colors. So these are the color picks you're familiar with. We get um, range sliders. We get floats, which are just a variable input. We get vectors and we get cube maps for reflections. Now don't worry if that makes no sense to you whatsoever. We'll actually be going to be looking through all of these later on. So let's take a look at structs. So structs are how our vertex and fragment functions talk to each other. These are like a base class for our functions. And we can assign special operators called semantics to variables in our structs. Now semantic contains information like normals, vertex position and texture coordinates. The vertex function can write to these semantics to change our geometry or as a temporary global variable that we can access in the fragment function. So here are our structs. So we are using the struct vertex input to take vertex data from the object and pass it to the vertex function. And we use the struct vertex output to write the data from the vertex function so we can pass it to the fragment function. So let's take a look at the vertex program. So the vertex program deals with everything once per vertex per frame. We use vertex input struct as a base and we write to vertex output. So these names are optional, you can, write, you can change the names of your structs to anything you like. 
I tend to use vertex input uh, because we are taking the, the input from the vertices to our vertex program and I use vertex output because we're taking the output from our vertex program to the vertex output struct. Once we're done, we return vertex output to use in the fragment shader. The only requirement is that we write out the vertex position so Unity knows where to render our object. Everything else is extra. The fragment program. Now the fragment program deals with everything once per pixel per frame. It's also referred to as the pixel shader. And we use vertex output struct as a base. When we are done, we return a final output color. We must be careful not to overload the fragment program. We can quickly destroy performance with heavy code. Float, half, and fixed. Now these are things that a uh, programmer should probably know, but personally, I didn't actually look into the difference between these until I started writing shaders. So I want to briefly cover the differences between these right now. So a float, a float is a floating point integer. These are the ones you're probably the most familiar with and they're really cool and you know they're, they're very convenient to use but they are the most expensive to render so not by much but they can make the difference between a shader working on a um, working on a mobile device and bogging down the mobile device half so a half is a plus or minus 60,000 range and it's 3.3 decimal points of precision now that sounds like a really big number and it is. So it, quite often we can use a half to do most of our calculations. So these are much more efficient. And then we have a fixed. Now a fixed has a plus or minus 2.0 range with a 1 over 256 point of precision. Now this sounds like a very small number, which it is, and it's very efficient, and it is the most optimized, but quite often, especially when it comes to working with colors and dot products, our values don't actually go beyond 1 and negative 1. So we can use fixed for most of our calculations. For the beginner and the intermediate series, we'll be sticking to floats for consistency. Now in the last part of this beginner series, I will be showing you how we can use these to optimize our shader. And in the advanced series, we will be only working with optimized shaders. So we'll pretty much ditch using floats for the entirety of the um, advanced series. I just want you to understand the differences at this stage. Alright, so now that we have covered the theory, it is time to put it into practice. I am now going to create a material and a shader in Unity 4, assign the material to a surface, and I'm going to create a flat color shader from scratch. I'll re-explain a lot of this theory lesson as I write the shader.